Hi, my name is Laura Conley, and I'm the fur bear biologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation. Today, we're going to talk about black bear in Missouri, go over the status of our bear population, research related to that population, and black bear management. Now, bears were once common and abundant throughout the forested areas of Missouri, but over-exploitation and habitat loss drove their numbers very, very low. And it was thought for a long time that by the 1950s, bears were extirpated from the state. Some of our recent research indicates that we did have a small remnant population in the southern part of the state. However, bear numbers were driven to very, very low, almost near zero in some cases. Arkansas Game and Fish had done some bear reintroductions in the late 1950s to 1960s, and inevitably some of these bears came up into Missouri. So we have documented records of some of these bears showing up within the state, but over time, our bear sightings began to increase as well, and likely largely driven by those reintroduction efforts in Arkansas, as well as that small remnant population growing within the state. So over time, bear numbers increased, and Around 1993, I think we had done an initial management plan that really looked at bear sightings, what potential uh, range we had for bears within the state. And then that management plan was updated in 2008 when it was apparent that we had a growing bear population. The question at the time was, what level is our population at? What habitat types are they using? We really didn't know a lot about our bear population at that point, other than we were documenting bear sightings in new areas, reproduction in certain parts of the state. So we were able to go through and with our initial research project, get an initial population estimate around 2012, um, around 300 to 300. 350 bears, and that's the number that you've been hearing thus far. Now, currently in Missouri, bears are becoming increasingly more common. Our bear population is expanding in range geographically, and that population is growing in size. But with that growing population, we're also seeing nuisance complaints becoming more common and widespread as well. Now, we can track that bear range and those nuisance complaints through bear sightings that are submitted through the public. So we gather these sightings through email, phone calls, visits with folks coming into regional offices and things like that. And we also have an online report form where folks can submit those sightings. So we collect these sightings in a variety of different fashions, and they all go into one database where we can look at them as a whole. Now, we can see that primary bear range in the state of Missouri is primarily south of I-44 in the forested areas of that region of the state. But we do have that expanding population and range expansion occurring. So the areas identified in blue on this map are those areas that we've identified as expansion areas. So in these parts of the state, we have bear numbers increasing. We are starting to see some reproduction occurring in areas, say, south of St. Louis. We frequently get sightings of young males that are wandering through. But these areas identify locations in the state where we can expect that bear population to start expanding into. Now, these areas also coincide with high human population density. So down the road, this is where we can see management challenges coming up. As those bear numbers increase, we're starting to see greater numbers of of bears occurring in areas where we have higher human population densities. A couple years ago, we had a bear show up in Baldwin near the St. Louis suburbs. That bear basically made its way through a variety of those suburbs. It was quite visible. We got a lot of reports of that. We have bears that show up around Lake of the Ozarks, areas that have that high human population density. So in these areas, we're looking at focusing education, getting folks up to speed on living with bears now that that population is expanding. We can also look at our bear sighting reports um, and break them down by the type of sighting, by the type of report that it is. So we can look at it as an observation or an interaction. Now, interactions are typically the reports that we would classify as some type of nuisance activity or you know, a circumstance where a bear interacted with some aspect of the human environment. When we look at the types of reports that we get, the vast majority of them are observations, and that's a very good thing. So most of the time, folks are submitting trail camera photos or pictures of a bear that, you know, crossed the road in front of them or simply saying, hey, I saw a bear passing through or saw a bear while I was hiking. Those are all good reports, and we want to point out that the bulk of our reports are really those observation types. But when we do break down those interaction types, we can see a common theme. And as we talk a little bit more about bears, you'll understand why some of these interaction types occur. When we look at these interactions, a lot of them are related to food. So trash, bird feeders, uh, potentially beehives, pet food, things like that. Now, we can look at these spatially and determine 
do we need to do certain types of outreach in various counties? So the counties, for example, that have higher trash issues, where trash is the common theme for these interactions. We can now start to work with those communities in those areas to secure trash, talk about bear-resistant canisters, um, proper storage for trash, things like that. Um, Areas where bird feeders might be the common theme for interactions, we can work with communities in those areas to talk about bringing in bird feeders when bears are active and making sure that folks aren't drawing bears into their neighborhoods. And then we can look at these interactions down the road and over the next several years to see if those educational efforts are moving the needle in the type of interactions that we're seeing and the proportion of interactions to observations. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some basic bear biology, and then we'll discuss some of the research that we've got going on with bears as well. Bears primarily use forested areas, so they are a forest-dependent species. Um, Our bears here in Missouri typically use larger tracts of forested land, and as that population grows, we do expect that they will become a little bit more tolerant to um, certain types of fragmentation, Uh, but they are very heavily reliant on forest. We'll also have bears use wetland locations. Now, these areas are primarily used in the spring when that first emergent vegetation comes up, Um, but they do use these areas, and they will often den in close proximity to some of these wetlands to be close to that um, very first spring foods. Bears will also use agricultural areas. Now, you typically won't see a bear moving through very open um, agriculture, so typically not large expanses of row crop. But when forest meets row crop or when forest meets agriculture, we do have bears that may go in and utilize some of those food sources. So um, in August and September, when sweet corn's in the milk stage, we'll have bears that may be attracted to that type of food source. Bears can also be attracted to orchards and berry patches where fruit might be the food source that they would be interested in. And then we do have bears that will use residential areas. And bears are very adaptable. As they become attracted to human-associated food sources, they may become more comfortable using those residential areas, and especially when some of those homes are near forests. So bears have the ability to move from neighborhood into forest and use that type of habitat matrix. Now, bears are opportunistic omnivores, so they eat whatever is easiest and most readily available. Now, in spring, we're talking those wetland plants. They may eat leftover acorns if we had an abundant mass crop the fall before or carrion that's left over from the winter. Uh, But when they emerge from their winter dens, there's not a lot of food out there available to them. Now, as summer comes along, bears will start to eat grasses, and that kind of tides them over until the berry crop becomes available. And during the summer months, they rely very heavily on on berries, and they'll also rely pretty heavily on insects and insect larvae. So tearing up logs, looking for grubs, digging up ground hornet's nests, eating the larvae of those, things like that. And then in the fall, they completely switch gears and rely very heavily on hard mast. So things like acorns and other types of tree nuts, um, and then any of those fall fruits that might be available. But that hard mast, primarily that acorn crop, is really important for bears because it's a very high calorie food. And And they will feed for approximately 20 hours a day. They'll consume about 20,000 calories a day in the fall, really fattening themselves up to prepare for that winter denning season. So you can see, given that acorns are such an important food source, that in the fall, they really are using those forested areas primarily. But again, bears are attracted to those human-associated foods. And given that they are opportunistic omnivores, they'll eat whatever's easiest and most readily available, they may be drawn in to residential areas or to homesteads looking for that easy meal. Uh, Think of a bear as a big raccoon, not diminishing the fact that the bear is a large animal and very strong, but think of what foods a raccoon might be attracted to. And bears will be attracted to the same things. So trash, compost, um, the grease traps on grills and smokers, pet food, beehives, bird feeders, things like that all draw bears in. And when a bear gets an easy meal, it starts to learn over time that it can use that type of food source. And we will have the occasion where bears will start visiting trash cans and they learn it's an easy food source. And then so they continue that behavior. Um, Bears that visit bird feeders will often visit those same bird feeders year after year if they're still available. So they can be very drawn in to those human associated foods, which inevitably attracts them to those residential areas. Now, bears typically den in the fall 
because of food shortages over the winter. So they consume as many calories as they can to prepare for that winter denning. And depending on food availability, they typically go in the winter den um, anywhere between October and December. The bulk of our bears typically um, enter the den between November and December. Um, in food shortage years, they may enter the den earlier than that. Now, pregnant females give birth in the den, so they will always den. And they typically are the first bears to enter the den, and they typically stay in the longest. Now, now, bears that have yearlings with them, so one-year-old young, or bears that are by themselves may den later. Um, and sometimes if food's available, they don't even stay in that den for very long. So they may den, hole up for a couple of weeks, move around, look for food, den again, hole up for a couple of weeks. But it's all about trade-offs. So if they are spending more calories looking for food, then they're going to stay in the den because they do go through a lot of physiological changes that allow them to remain in that den all winter long without eating eating, without drinking, without urinating or defecating. So they have a lot of adaptations to make it through the winter when food wouldn't be available. Here in Missouri, we're also very lucky to have a very long-term bear research project. So we started our bear research project in 2010, and that initial goal of that project was to gain the initial population estimate. So we knew we had bears, we knew we had reproducing bears, but we didn't know how many bears. So that initial population estimate in 2012 showed us that we have about 300 to 350 bears. But then the question was, well, how quickly is that population growing? So our current research project, we have collars out on female bears to gather information on survival, reproduction, cub survival, all of the key factors that will help determine how quickly that population is growing. And all of this information is being used to develop a bear population model. So this population model will allow us to assess the growth rate of our population and develop that current population estimate. We can also test various harvest scenarios as that comes into play in the future when we're looking at potentially implementing a bear season. Now, our current population estimate estimates that we have about 540 to 840 bears statewide, and that population is growing approximately 9% annually. Now, in 2008, our management plan established a benchmark of 500 bears when the department would initiate a hunting season. So now that our population is above that benchmark, the department can begin those deliberations looking at that potential hunting season. We also have the ability to look at bear habitat use. So all of our bears have GPS collars. Those GPS collars take detailed location information and we can look at that location information and determine how bears are utilizing the habitat here in Missouri. What types of forest are they using? How are they moving through that forest? What corridors might be important for bears? And what corridors might be available as that bear population expands? So we can use that habitat information to really get a detailed look at how our bear population is utilizing the landscape, how that population might spread across the landscape, and looking at that potential range expansion. We can also use this habitat information to help inform bear education, identify potential areas where we expect bears to begin showing up or where we expect that range expansion to occur. We could also utilize this information to help look at harvest frameworks or habitat management and conservation as well. Now, shifting gears from research, I'd like to talk a little bit about being bear aware. So we have a very uh, extensive Be Bear Aware educational campaign here. We have a lot of material on our website. You'll see frequent Facebook posts and news release about being bear aware. And this is really important because as that population grows, bears are expanding into areas, coming into contact with human populations as well. And so getting that message out about being proactive and preventing any of those potential negative interactions is really important. And the vast majority of being bear aware stems from being knowledgeable about what attracts bears. So removing those potential food sources. So first and foremost, never approach or feed bears. Remove all of those food sources. So take a look at your yard, remove any bird feeders, secure pet food and garbage, um, never leave pet food outside. Basically, removing all of those potential attractants. And if you're out camping or hiking, keeping that in mind also. And let your neighbors know. If you have a bear that is spotted in your neighborhood, have that conversation with your neighbors. It takes the whole neighborhood effort to ensure that food sources are secure. If somebody's got bird feeders out or somebody has unsecured trash, that bear may still visit that neighborhood looking for those food sources. And remember, a fed bear is a dead bear. We use this old adage a lot. You'll hear it a lot. And it's a really important message. 
as bears become more comfortable accessing human foods, they may start to develop more bold behaviors trying to get at those foods. And in those instances, those bears would likely need to be euthanized. So ensuring that you are removing those food sources and not allowing those bears to become accustomed to that, we're really preventing bears from developing some of those problem behaviors. Now, if you see a bear in your yard, enjoy the sighting. Make loud noises to deter that bear. You can bang pots and pans. If you have an air horn, blow that air horn, use a whistle. Um, anything that might give that bear a little bit of pause to allow it to move on. Um, but after that bear leaves, make sure you're removing any food sources. So now that you've had that bear sighting, take a really good hard look at your yard and see if there's anything that might have attracted that bear to the yard. It's certainly possible that the bear was just passing through, but you want to make sure that if it does pass through again, there's not anything that's going to encourage it to stay. We do have the ability for department staff to utilize aversive conditioning for persistent bears, so bears that visit these human types of food sources quite frequently. Staff can go out and use things like screamer shells, cracker shells, rubber buckshot, um, things like that that are very strong deterrents for these bears. But ideally, we're removing those food sources before bears ever become persistent. Now, if you encounter a bear, talk to the bear in a calm voice. Back away. Don't run. You want to make sure that that bear has an escape route. You can put your arms up above your head, um, allow that bear to know that you're there. But basically, back out of the area and give that bear a chance to leave. Enjoy the sighting for what it is. Don't try to get closer to take pictures. Don't do anything to encourage the bear to come closer. Don't throw food on the ground or anything like that. Um, but just allow that bear to leave on its own. If you're camping and hiking in bear country, you can travel in groups, make noise while you're out there. Um, sometimes simply having a conversation while you're hiking or whistling is enough noise to alert a bear of your presence. In most cases, that bear is long gone before you even get up close to it. Keep food sources secure. If you're camping, uh, make sure that you are cooking and sleeping in separate areas. You don't want to sleep in the clothes that you cooked in. You certainly don't want to store food in your tent. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not offering any attractants for that bear to come in and investigate. Store food in secure containers, whether that be a lockbox or a locked vehicle with the windows closed, uh, but make sure that you're not providing any attraction for bears at your campsite. Uh, and if you do want to carry bear spray, know how to use it. There are specific situations where bear spray would be deployed, and you want to make sure that you are properly trained on how to use that. You can find instructional videos online that would show you the proper way of deploying that and under what circumstances you would deploy that bear spray, but you want to avoid the situation where you are deploying it inappropriately and potentially spraying yourself or hiking partners and things like that. If you're hunting in bear country, the same information applies. So making sure you're not attracting bears to where you're hunting. Keep a clean camp if you're out camping. Um, while you're out moving to your stands, um, I know it's sometimes challenging. We say alert bears of your presence and make noise. And I know as you're walking out in the morning or leaving at night, you're trying to be as quiet as possible. But just recognizing where you are, if there's the potential for um, an encounter with a bear, sometimes it's good to make that noise as you're moving through to alert bears of your presence. And then we do have instances where bears may explore tree stands. So they come up to the base of the stand and there's some type of smell that draws them or curiosity that draws them up that ladder. So you want to alert the bear of your presence. If you're up in your stand and you see a bear, make sure that you're alerting that bear early on. You don't want it to start climbing the ladder before you make any noise. And we've had instances in other parts of the country have seen this also where folks get their phone out and they're trying to take really good footage of that bear and the bear's climbing up the ladder. They're videotaping it. You don't want to do that alert the bear of your presence, don't allow it to get close. And then if you do have a bear sighting, report it to us. We really like those sightings. As you saw before, we can use these sighting reports to look at range expansion, um, the types of reports that are coming in, whether they're interactions that we need to think about education or whether they're just observations. Um, but submit those sightings to us. You can submit them online at the website below. If you use the online report form, you can upload a photo at that time also. You'll get an email reply from somebody in the BEAR program, and that's an opportunity if you have additional questions, you can ask those additional questions, or if you have other footage, photos, and videos, you can submit them then also. Um, or if you visit any of your regional offices, they have Black Bear observation cards, and you can fill out one of those observation cards and send that in to us. But we certainly do appreciate those BEAR reports being submitted. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about our draft black bear management plan, primarily the goals and objectives of this plan. 
The draft mission statement for our bear management plan is to use science-based methods to manage a self-sustaining population of black bear, a native species, while minimizing human bear conflict, increasing bear awareness, and providing recreational opportunities for all Missourians. Now, in looking at this draft plan, we want to point out that it's a multifaceted approach. So we are looking at a lot of different aspects of bear management with this plan. Previously, a lot of our management plan um, had been focused on gathering more information on our bear population. So identifying those research gaps, un- trying to gain an understanding of what our population was doing, where we had bears occurring within the state. And we have answered a lot of those questions at this point. And now we're kind of in a paradigm shift where we're moving away from just identifying those research needs. Those will always be important and we'll continue to identify those needs as they develop, but really looking at a multifaceted approach to bear management. Goal one is really focused on using science-based methods to manage that self-sustaining bear population, looking at research, um, different types of monitoring, population management with hunting being the primary tool for population management, as well as habitat management. Goal two is really focused on human dimensions, using public input and human dimension surveys to inform decisions related to bear management, Uh, recreational opportunities, looking at public opinion and interest of the bear population um, to really gain an understanding of what Missourians think about our bear population, what they know about the bear population. Goal three really focuses on minimizing and addressing human bear conflicts. So looking at this proactively and reactively. Education for prevention um, in the proactive sense, preventing those conflicts from even occurring, but recognizing that when we have bears occurring in the same proximity as we have human populations, conflicts are inevitable. Bears will be attracted to human-associated food sources. That type of thing will happen. So recognizing that we will also have to address those conflicts as they occur. And the last goal focuses on statewide awareness. So bear education, increasing that statewide awareness of Missouri's bear population and management program through coordinated outreach. And this could be through social media, news media, print media, as well as public presentations, informational meetings, and things like that. So really increasing that statewide awareness of bears here in Missouri. We really appreciate the time that you've spent listening to this presentation, and we look forward to your input on our bear management plan, as well as bears in the state of Missouri. Thank you.